This topic is about exception handling, and exception handling is not an area that's terribly sexy, but um, I think it's something that deserves more attention than it gets. Um, and in fact, I've never seen uh, anyone ever give a presentation on it, even though it's a fact of life with any kind of application. And in particular, it's more prominent in Java because of things like checked exceptions, where you're forced to have to deal with these exceptions, which maybe you're not ready to um, worry about just yet. You're trying to get the happy path to work, let alone get your exceptions to work. Now, uh, I thought I would start with some puzzles to start with, to do with uh, exceptions. So some interesting corner cases that um, I think are useful. Um, some anti-patterns, like what not to do with exceptions except in very rare cases. And then I'll look at some patterns of use that we use. We use around about, um, well over 10 different ways of handling exceptions, depending on the use case. So um, there is a variety of things that you can do when you have exception handling. And in fact, I've, I've spoken to this a number of, um, actually, uh, Java champions. And often their response is, well, when something goes wrong, there's not much you can do about it, usually. Well, I wouldn't actually agree. That, that's, you, you'll see there's actually a variety of things that you can do. So here's the first puzzle. I've created a class that extends throwable. Not error, not exception, extends throwable. Does anyone have any idea what would happen if I then threw this throwable, or my custom throwable? Uh, any takers? Sorry? It won't be called caught. Yes, this is correct because, in fact, um, this throwable is neither an exception nor an error. And, in fact, the, the clue is in this throws clause up here, which is required for it to compile. That's because throwable is checked. In fact, all throwables are checked except for error and runtime. So a lot of people think that, oh, well, all the exceptions are unchecked except for exceptions. But in reality, the default is checked except for these two use cases. Um, I've never seen anyone actually do this, by the way, but you can. It's one of the things it allows. Um, I.O. exception. So this is a little problem I showed uh, yesterday during the workshop. And that is, I've got two uh, expressions here. So in this one, I'm submitting a job to a background thread and I'm reading all the lines of the file, and then for each line, I'm going to print out that line. Now, the interesting thing here is that if I do return null, it compiles just fine. However, if I take out the return null, the error message I get is unreported exception, IO exception, must be caught. Which is a bit surprising. Like, why, why is it that if I take out the return value, it's now complaining about the I.O. exception, which I didn't call. I didn't catch it in the first one either, but now I'm forced to. Has anyone got any ideas as to what that might be? Ah, yeah? Yes, so the first one is a callable. What's the second one? Runnable. So by, um, by virtue of the return type, the Java 8 compiler has said, well, the first one must be a callable. I'm returning a value. The second one must be a runnable. I'm not returning a value. And one of the differences between callable and runnable is that callable can throw checked exceptions. Runnable cannot. And so as a result of removing the return type, I've indirectly been forced to handle I.O. exceptions, which is possibly a good thing. But uh, nevertheless, it's a sort of a surprising outcome, or it was to me. Um, unchecked I.O. exceptions. So um, one of the um, interesting features of new instance is that um, it doesn't wrap checked exceptions. It just passes them up blindly. So if you've got a constructor, such as this one, which could throw a checked exception, you can call it with new instance, and um, it's got no idea, you've got no idea that it actually could throw an I.O. exception. 
And this is because the JVM at runtime doesn't actually have a concept of checked exceptions. Checked exceptions are a feature of the language and the compiler, but at runtime, there is actually no difference between how it handles checked and unchecked exceptions. And this means that a checked exception could be ended up treated like an unchecked one at runtime uh, if you're not careful or not doing it deliberately. So new instance is one of these methods that uh, rather incorrectly doesn't wrap it so that you could get a checked exception and just not realize it. Um, if you get the constructor, for example, so an API was added later to get the constructor, and then you call new instance on it, that actually does wrap checked exceptions. In fact, it wraps all exceptions, checked or otherwise. Whereas this one doesn't wrap um, anything. Uh, whatever exception you throw here actually gets passed out. So, um, has anyone come across this? So you can actually do this um, just using generics. So um, by using this trick, you can, by using generics, allows you to throw a checked exception as if it were an unchecked one. So in this case, I'm taking an XQL exception, which is checked, um, and I'm throwing it, but by using this cast, it thinks it's an unchecked exception. So the compiler is just not doing its check to say, hey, you're throwing a checked exception in a context that doesn't expect it. So what happens is that um, this checked exception gets thrown up, but um, it's not in the throws clause. So one of the reasons I might do this is a method like this. So I've got a, um, I'm collecting a whole results from files. Um, it, I've got some code which might throw a checked exception, this one, but I'm using an stream API that doesn't support checked exceptions. Flatmap, the, um, the function here, can't be checked. So what, what's happening here is that if I get a checked exception, I rethrow it so the compiler will allow it to go outside this method and break it, and then I'm declaring it again here as an I.O. exception. And by doing that, I've now allowed it to pass that I.O. exception all the way up through an API, which itself doesn't allow it. Um, but it will actually behave and function the way you might expect. A surprising thing about exceptions is how big they are. So yesterday in the workshop, we looked at how can you tell how big an object is um, by looking at the memory used before and after you create the object. And with a little bit of care, it is possible to do that. But in, in the case of exceptions, they're actually quite a bit bigger than you might expect because exceptions are not only the fields you see in your Java code, there's about a half a, megabyte, a, half a kilobyte of extra data which is added to the end of the object, which you can't see. And this is to um, recreate the stack information. Because in reality, the stack trace isn't created until you call it for the first time. So the amount of memory used if you don't ask for a stack trace is actually 600 bytes for this one exception that just takes a small string. So it's an interesting feature that exceptions can actually be quite a bit bigger than you might expect. So in this case, I'm creating an exception inside this thread and then um, capturing it into a queue and then I'm throwing it in another thread. What stack trace will I see if I print it out? Which line should the stack trace show? So it's the stack trace when the exception is created, not when it's thrown. Now, usually you create and throw an exception on the same line, so there's no confusion. But if you create an exception in one place and throw it in another, it will be where you created it, in the thread you created it, not the one you threw it on. Now, there is another method called fill stack trace, which will reinitialize it with wherever you are right now. Okay, so an anti-pattern. This is probably the biggest anti-pattern when it comes to exceptions. I've got a bit of code that now doesn't compile um, because it's got a checked exception. What do I do with it? Oh, well, I'll just wrap it and then pretend it didn't happen, which is all very good. Uh, as long as your code works all the time and every file it looks for is always there. But in this case, um, this is a very bad idea because what happens is that, not, not here but later, you'll get a null pointer exception because this value is null 
and it blows up anyway. Still get an exception, but the cause is really being obscured. Worse than that, it's doing all these little try catches makes your code harder to read as well. So you've got more verbose code, it's hard to read and hard to diagnose. The simple answer is just don't do that. Don't just have all these little catches all over the place. You actually want to catch an exception when you're ready to do something with it. And if you're not ready, throw it up to its parent and to its parent. Eventually, it might just get logged, but um, that, that's a last resort. So don't just catch them in little bits all over the place because that will create um, more of a problem than it saves. Uh, another way of pretending it didn't happen is you log it and then continue as if it didn't happen. You're still going to get a null pointer exception blowing up later, but at least you logged it first. So it's a little less obscure, but it's still a bad idea. Um, you don't want to be doing that. So what do we actually do? So I did a review of our code base to see how we handle exceptions. And admittedly, when I did this review, I actually went through and changed a lot of them because actually they weren't ideal and it was ad hoc. And um, the code had been written by different developers at different times. And so there was a bit of inconsistency. But after going through and reviewing it and making it consistent, this is the sort of distribution we ended up with. Now, the, one of the things I tried very hard to do was that the most common um, way of handling an exception was to fall back gracefully, to have some uh, workaround, some other means of attempting to continue or recover from that exception. Now, that's easier in um, infrastructure code because often there is some other way of dealing with it. But um, nevertheless, that is what I consider to be the ideal when you catch an exception, if it's possible to recover in some way, um, please do so. So looking at some of these patterns in a bit more detail, um, so this is the, um, uh, often the best way, if you don't know what to do with an exception, you throw it out of the method. This prevents a null pointer exception just being thrown further down the line. You skip out all the code that depends on that working by doing it implicitly. And you make it the caller's job to, um, to worry about it, because none of this operation will work if you get an I.O. exception, particularly at the start. So if you can identify what to do if you get an exception, then you, you can fall back to some other one. Usually fall back some much more complex than this. I picked this as an example because it's easy to read. Um, a lot of the fallback code is usually more complicated than the code that uh, you're falling back from because you're trying to recover from an error, but nevertheless, I, I see this as an ideal. So here's an example where it uses a fallback. Um, what it's trying to do is find a field by name inside a class. So it starts with, give me all the fields inside that, find the field inside that class, but if it fails, then it goes to its parent and attempts to do the same again. And it keeps going up through all the methods. Finally, it says, well, um, I'm assuming you've got a code bug. If you've asked for a field that doesn't exist, that's a code bug. And the way we handle code bugs is we say this is an assertion error. This is something we believe should never happen. So we throw an assertion error in that situation. It seems like inner exception would be ignored. Uh, it will ignore the inner exception. It will throw the outermost one. So um, these, these exceptions will nest because if it's nowhere, it will actually throw it for every class it fails to find it in. So yes, it will throw several exceptions, but the one we wrap is the outermost one because that will be the most descriptive. It will say, cannot find this field inside this class. So at least you see the outermost class it attempted. If you took the innermost one, it goes all the way up to object. Object has no field. So you'd get an exception that says, object does not have this field. It's not as useful as the most outer one. So yes, there's quite a few exceptions this will effectively discard. And then it picks one of them uh, 
That's one process. There's another way where you can add suppressed. So the method on exception called add suppressed, you can say, uh, not only did I throw this exception, but there was all these other ones I suppressed. In this case, it's kind of redundant because once you know the outer, the most subclass, you know its parents, and it went through all of them. Okay, so another pattern we use is uh, having an exception handler. So we have a class that gets called so that it knows what to do when you get an exception. So a simple way of handling this is to log the exception. That's one trivial way of doing it. You've got the opportunity of injecting other ways of handling it, but in particular, um, the one we use the most is one that just records them in a collection. And the reason we do that is for um, unit tests. So we had a lot of unit tests that would pass, but while they were running, they would, they would log some exceptions. So even though the unit test was passing, something was clearly going wrong in some thread. Because it wasn't in the current thread, it was in a background thread. Maybe it was failing on close. So it had done what it needed to do, but the shutdown wasn't clean. So it would blow up. But that didn't stop the exception from working, or the test from working. So what we now do is, in every case, we record every exception that's thrown. And then at the, as a standard part of our unit tests, we say these are the expected exceptions, if there are any. And if um, with, there are no expected exceptions, the test still fails if an exception is thrown, even if it didn't break the behavior of the test is trying to check. Another way of doing it, um, which is kind of cute, is that um, we've got an exception handler that when an exception is thrown, it, thro it opens a window in your browser on Stack Overflow and shows you what that exception means. Uh, so it pops up a new window. So one of the things you can see is that it only does this when debugging. So in a couple of cases, we do things testing to see, are you running in the debugger? And if you're running in the debugger and there's a desktop, then open up um, this exception in a URL, which shows me uh, what this means. Uh, otherwise, it has a wrapped exception. It says, OK, what's my fallback if, if in fact, I'm not debugging? Uh, one common pattern is what do you do when you're interrupted um, for a wait or a sleep or a blocking operation? Now, you can either throw that up uh, and break everything. Um, that's one way. Another way is just to reset the interrupt, which causes all your sleeps to just not really do very much. So it'll go through your code much quicker, uh, but not necessarily change its flow. So in this case, uh, what will happen is that if you interrupt this thread, it will stop sleeping, but it will reset the interrupt. So if there's another sleep, it will also break out very quickly. When we have an exception, which we believe is not possible. So in this case, this method is assumed to only work on in-memory streams. And because it's an in-memory stream, an in-memory stream won't ever throw an I.O. exception. And because there's no I.O. exception, um, we're assuming that that's impossible, and therefore what we, the way we deal with that as a standard way is we wrap it with an assertion error, uh, which is what um, assert will throw if a uh, condition fails. So by wrapping it with an assertion error, we're saying this something happened we thought was logically impossible. And we do this in quite a few places. We also use signals, um, exceptions as a signal, we don't use this a lot, but in some cases, it's very useful. So in this case, it's not an error has occurred, but there's a special flow control that's required to handle a particular condition. In this case, we're adding subscribers to a um, subscription list, but at some point, that subscriber may become aware that it uh, is no longer valid and it, when it's no longer valid, but it's still in a list, it throws an exception saying, remove me from this list, right? because I'm, I'm no longer active. Uh, so that's one, one case where we use it. Now, it's still a rare condition, because subscribers um, don't come and go in our system very often. But when they do disappear, they, we want to trigger a different flow of execution. One of the challenges of 
in a, particularly in a multi-threaded application, is using resources that get closed. And the reason this is a challenge is that one thread might close a resource while another one wants, still wants to use it. And tracing that down can be quite tricky. So the one way we deal with that is we say, well, when we're in debugging, but only when we're in debugging, because this has got a bit of overhead, we take a stack trace. But we take a stack trace indirectly by just creating a new throwable. So what will happen is if you attempt to use this resource in another thread after it's been closed, it will actually tell you where it was closed. And that can give you an idea as to why it was closed. Right? So you'll see the stack trace of exactly where was it closed before um, when you attempt to use it again. And that can help you debug why is it that I'm trying to use a resource some other thread closed on me. Or maybe I closed it earlier, but due to a coding error, it uh, forgot. Um, another thing we do is that we've got some tools where its job is just to dump out some data. And it's a best effort job. Right? We just need it to do um, something may have gone wrong, and we need to extract as much information as we can. But we don't actually want it, like if it finds some problem, we don't want it to cause the application to blow up. We want to see as much as we can before it blew up as well. So what we do is we just depend the exception on the end of the dump. So we see that, oh, well, this is the information it could work out. And then at a certain point, it just couldn't, couldn't proceed any further. It's just we got some error trying to decode it. Uh, temporarily checked exceptions. So one of the problems with unchecked exceptions is tracing um, and Java docking all of the methods that could throw an unchecked exception. And why? Right? Because there's no compiler support that will say, this is an interface that might show, throw this unchecked exception. You won't know that for sure. You can document it, but you don't know when it becomes out of date, so it no longer throws that exception. Or you don't know when it's been added by someone, and now um, it should really be documented. So we cheat. All we do is we have a number of unchecked exceptions that we use, and we've got a little library that goes and compiles them as if they were checked. So now what will happen when we do this is suddenly we, we trace all the way through the code all the places this unchecked exception might be thrown and right up to our Java doc. So in the Java doc, we can have confidence that all of the exceptions that are documented really do get thrown or could get thrown at some point. We'll have a better idea as to why they can get thrown. And, um, and then once this is done, we don't ship it like that then um, we take that back out, and it's now an unchecked exception. But our, we know that our documentation is up to date. Well, the last time I did this, I changed more than 30 methods, the documentation for them, because um, in many cases, uh, it, w it was documented as throwing a check an unchecked exception that was no longer the case. Maybe it was never the case, I don't know. And there were a whole lot of methods that were not reporting that they could throw this unchecked exception. And, but I was able to say why that might, that might happen as well. So this is starting to get into the exception handlers. So the default exception handlers is to log using SLS for J. But um, we also have the option to record exception handlers. So this one says, for a given exception, how many times did that exception occur? So, and then um, a Boolean to say whether debug exceptions are included or not. Uh, so by recording that, you set that at the start of a test, you, rec you run the test, and at the end you can check whether um, any exceptions occurred or not and which ones they were. And that way you know that your unit test in any thread did not throw an exception. So um, what we do is when we create temporary files, sometimes there's a lot of them or they're very big. Uh, when we're running in a unit test, we put them into the target directory. So that when you do a Maven clean, they all get de deleted. Um, this is particularly useful on Mac OS X because OS X will put um, your temporary files in a new directory each time. So going through and cleaning them up and finding them is quite hard. Whereas uh, in this case, by putting them under target, 
those, um, those uh, files get cleaned up on every time you clean your build. Um, methods for uh, getting memory access, low-level memory access, working out what the page alignment is. Because um, we do a lot of low-level memory manipulation, we actually care what the page sizes are. And 64-bit again, I think that's the same method. What process ID are we? So it's useful for logging to say which process ID your application is running as, and you can dump out, um, say to a log, I'm running as this process ID, so later if you want to do JSTAC or kill it, um, having the process ID can really be useful. And then there's um, low-level access to the memory mapping, which you wouldn't need to use. Uh, how much space is available on a particular file system um, before you write to it? And mapper. So I think they're the two sort of similar classes to that. So one of the things we do in util is that we have a bunch of both serializable and throwable collections. So if you have um, a consumer, normally a consumer can't throw a checked exception. But we have an interface which allows it to throw a checked exception. And so we have a throwable version of quite a lot of these. We have a string utility class for low-level string manipulation. So it grabs the underlying char array and then access it directly to speed up uh, both encoding, comparison, access. Um, so that could be quite helpful, Helen here. We have time. This is used, we use this for distributing nanotime across multiple machines. So if we want super accurate timings, we want to see variations in latencies between machines, we have a tool which will allow you to equate nanotime, which has got different starting points and drifts and stuff like that. So we correct for that. Um, got the core of our event loop. We've got a string pool. This one is an interesting one. Well, interesting to me anyway. I showed this to Brian Gitz. I was quite pleased with myself for having I spent an hour with Brian Getz, and um, I spent quite a good portion of it showing them this class. This class is interesting to me because it's a class that can be used by multiple threads, but there is no locking, no volatile, nothing. Um, the basic guarantees that the language provides is enough for this collection to work. So what you do is you give it a char sequence, such as a string builder, and it will return you a, an instance of a string. This is one of the ways in which we allow us to parse strings without creating too much garbage. It will keep trying to give you the same objects back. But what's interesting is that these objects are stored in an array. They're hashed into an array. And that array doesn't need to be thread safe. Different threads could have different views of what this array is doing. Um, but it doesn't matter because it just looks at the string that's available to that thread, and if that thread ma that string matches, then it's fine. It returns that string. So you've actually got um, a collection shared by threads that could have different values, but that's okay. And in fact, it's slightly better if they don't. They are not the same. So I think that's pretty cool. One of the ones you might find useful. Oh yeah. The exceptions handling library is called Onos, uh, which actually comes from LOL cats. Cats say Onos when things go wrong. So, um, so it's called Onos. And um, there has a web exception handler, which can be set for either Google or Stack Overflow. And it will do uh, throw a printout. Uh, it will open up a web page. Um, it has the ability to override certain exceptions and say, well, I know which web page is the best one. Don't have to search for it. So there's the Google one, Stack Overflow one, and SLF4J, of course. This is the one, this is a benchmark hardness we use for narrowing down exactly which line. Um, so in the earlier talk, I talked to, there was, there was one line of code that was causing us a latency jitter um, that was one in 100,000 times. And this is the tool we wrote and used to find out which line of code that was so we could fix it. Um, some different tools around um, closables. Now, something to note is one thing I do, which is not 
that standard is um, for utility classes, I use an enum. Because in an enum, you specify every possible instance. And for a utility class, there are none. So in this case, I use an enum of no instances for a utility class. For a singleton, I use an enum with one instance, because that's, it's a singleton. Um, the nice thing about that is a lot of the other boilerplate that you would normally have with either a utility or a singleton just goes away. You don't need any of it. So there are all the things in core, and the license is Apache 2, so it's free. So that was quite a long question, but hopefully people found that useful. Yes? Question for the best practice with exception handling. So in a multi-thread application, when we work with threads, we have a problem with null pointers. It is developer exception, but if you have it in code, you, there is some cases when you will know stack trace in log, just null pointer now. Yes. And in all, case, in all such places, we make assertion to check if it is null. If it's null, we throw illegal argument exception and see the stack trace and see the place. It is a lot, really a lot of condition in each public method and yes. a lot of trash, I think. So uh, how we, uh, what is the best practice uh, to work with and pay in such applications? Right. So... Um, uh, yeah, so when, when you have a value which might be null, you have to assume it might be null, right? Unless you know it can't be null. So the simplest way to make sure a value can't be null is to make it a primitive, right? So if you can take it something capital D double and make it lowercase d double, or capital L long and make it lowercase long, that's not just a performance improvement, which it is, but it's also a clarity. It says, this is a value, it can't be null. I'm now using a type which is not, can't possibly be null. So that's the best first step. It's not always possible, of course. Now, um, they've recently added a class called objects, and objects has... Mm, some verifications. So the best practice is probably to use something like objects.notNull, non-null. Uh, we don't in general, but that's, that, uh, that's what I would say is best practice. Um, uh, here's another one which is um, if it's null, and uh, there's also an equals here that handles null values in, in objects. So uh, you can do a comparison between two references, and if one of them is null, it's not going to blow up. It will still do the comparison. Um, so, uh, yes, you, you can end up with quite a bit of code, boilerplate code. Um, one of the things we do do is use at not null annotation, which um, IntelliJ can um, detect and do static code analysis to work out whether a field can be null or not. Um, and we do use that. Um, it can inject code, something we used to use a lot, but not so much anymore. Uh, part of the problem is that you have classes like map. There are some classes that expect that if you pass a null, that it will throw an invalid argument exception, not a null pointer exception. So to comply with the contract, it means you can't just inject, um, uh, have a, a automatic injection. So, so we've moved away from automatic injection of testing, checking, but um, you might find that that works for you um, to have some sort of plug-in that wherever something is at not null annotated that it will inject a check for you um, and return values at not null can have on it and fields as well. So that's something IntelliJ has a plug-in for but you don't have to use theirs. It's, I'm sure there are others. Uh, I would like to ask to my college. Uh, if you would like to see exactly line when <clears throat> where your uh, null pointer exception was thrown, uh, you need to enable omit stack trace in fast throw option of GVM oh. because uh, yeah because uh, usually GVM hides this stack trace for such kind yeah. of exceptions. But, but by default, it will only hide the stack trace after you've um, done, had that exception several hundred times on that line of code. Right? So if you're now seeing in your logs no stack trace, 
that means it's been happening for a long time. It may be in a log file that's now been rolled off and disappeared, but if you capture it early enough, you should always get a stack trace the first few times that that exception happens. When it happens repeatedly is when it says, oh, well, I'm going to optimize this now and by taking the stack trace off. Um, and that works well for when you're using it as a signal. So one of my examples, I, ha I use it only as a signal. So uh, that way, I don't actually care about the stack trace, and I never will. And I'm not going to print it. It's just for handling it. And that's because there are certain libraries that use exceptions as a natural part of the code. So for example, in Scala, if you want to use break or continue, they throw exceptions so that the calling library can catch it, because you can jump out of your Lambda, and the calling library can capture that and then handle it. So return as well. So that, that way you can return in the middle of a code flow, and it knows how to deal with that. Um, but that means you're throwing an exception, which wouldn't be so good if it was really expensive. So then they optimize it by not creating the stack trace once it's been called a few times, it seems well. This is not really an error. It's more of a signal. Um, but um, so uh, yeah. So if if you are getting that, you can turn it off the optimization. So it never does it, and that way you will always get the stack trace. But that could have a performance hit. All right. Well, thank you very much thank for listening. Thank you, Peter, to me. so much.